Picture the scene, if you will. A young couple return to a dingy, run-down hotel room, perhaps after a night out, something which is suggested by their formal attire that contrasts with their surroundings, and presumably with the intention of participating in some amorous escapades. They sit at a table and share a bottle of wine. The camera dollies to a door that is behind them. The handle turns. As the couple kiss, a trio of hoodlums enter. Holding the couple at gunpoint, the hoodsman handle the young woman and beats her boyfriend. As one of the thugs drags the woman to her bed and pours to her, she transforms into a hideous hag. Her boyfriend has also become something supernatural and powerful. He pushes his tormentors down and they scream unconvincingly. Cut to Mahika in the director's chair, surrounded by his crew. Cut, he says, in a nonplussed manner. This is the opening to Jose Mojica Marin's 1974 film Bloody Exorcism, which is arguably one of the most impressive pictures made by the director, who preferred to be known as Mojica. Mojica sets up a scene familiar from so many exploitation films, and given the cheap jack production of the film within the film, the viewer might be forgiven for thinking that they have stumbled onto a pornographic ruffie. Then he pulls the rug from beneath the viewer's understanding of what they have just watched. Just as the viewer has settled into watching a cheap, somewhat conventional horror film, the poverty of its production established in the single and singularly unimpressive location, we cut to Mahika in the director's chair, his camera crew scattered around him, and the viewer realises that what they have seen unfold is, in fact, material for a film within the film. With this, Mahika opens a film that seems so incredibly ahead of its time, anticipating such director-centred metafilms about horror filmmakers as Lucio Fulci's 1990 masterpiece, at least I'll happily call it that, and Ghetto Nel Ciavello, known in English as A Cat in the Brain or Nightmare Concert, and Wes Craven's New Nightmare from a few years later. Like those films, Bloody Exorcism sees its director, Mohika, appearing as himself, in other words, as Jose Mohica Marins, the filmmaker, directly confronting his work and its legacy. As an aside, Bloody Exorcism is also one of the most unusual Christmas set films ever. Try throwing this picture on at Christmas and having a good time with the family. The title of Bloody Exorcism is an obvious attempt to capitalise on the popularity of William Friedkin's The Exorcist, released the year prior. However, the film's title also suggests that Mohika was using the film to exercise himself of Coffin Joe, the character that played by Mohika himself, Mahika had first introduced to Brazilian cinema audiences in his first horror picture at Midnight I'll Take Your Soul in 1964. A nihilistic undertaker with a distinctive costume of black suit, cape and top hat, whose presence anchors many of Mahika's films, at least those films of Mahika that have had distribution outside Brazil, Coffin Joe became a cult figure in Brazil. An atheist who, in At Midnight I'll Take Your Soul, is introduced performing various irreligious acts, including eating meat on Good Friday, asserting, what do I care if it's holy or the devil's Friday, I'll get what I want and no Bible thumper will stop me. Across the series of films in which he features, Coffin Joe seeks the immortality of blood, as he calls it, through impregnating, sometimes forcibly, various women across the series of films. In At Midnight I'll Take Your Soul, he progresses from simple acts of blasphemy to gambling on a holy day, rape, and eventually cold-blooded murder. In Coffin Joe, Mahika created a character that was exploited in cinema, on television and in print. The Brazilian equivalent of Freddy Krueger or Michael Myers, Coffin Joe was born in a fever dream experienced by Mahika, and has been described as a uniquely Brazilian monster. Needless to say, Coffin Joe is an utterly despicable character, cruel and sadistic, utterly self-interested, and with a misogynistic streak that is more than a mile wide. But, at the same time, his vein of anti-authoritarianism and individualism no doubt spoke to audiences who were at the time experiencing the the repression of Brazil's military dictatorship. An avowed populist, Mohica's work is also deeply esoteric and often highly personal. In a number of films, Mahika himself appears as a character, engaging in a dialogue with his own most famous creation. Mahika's filmography is diverse and difficult to pin down, but unified by the filmmaker's resourcefulness in constructing a strange, otherworldly atmosphere with minimal resources. 
the pictures themselves are predominantly very, very cheaply produced. Mahika would invest money from a previous production into a subsequent film, which caused problems when one of his films would be banned by the Brazilian censors, as, as was the case with Awakening of the Beast in 1970, thus removing Mahika's stream of finance for producing his next picture. However, there is a clear sense of an authorial voice being developed and practised or enacted. The films themselves are often camp, but also philosophical, comparable to the work of, say, Andy Milligan, Jess Franco, John Waters or Roberta Finlay. The absurd and camp elements within Mika's work are often intentional, but it's also clear that they are sometimes unintentional too. Throughout the series of films in which he features, Coffin Joe evolves from an avowed atheist to a figure comparable to Satan himself, presiding over a hellish inferno of torture and degradation. Bloody exorcism takes place midway through the wider narrative of the Coffin Joe pictures. There is a sense here of Mahika engaging in a dialogue with his own creation, Coffin Joe himself, his motivation for creating such a character, and the responses of his films, audiences and critics. After the aforementioned opening sequence, we follow Mojica to a press conference where he is asked by a journalist, who is more important, Jose Mojica Marins or Coffin Joe? Coffin Joe does not exist, Mojica reminds the gathered reporters, at which point a spotlight explodes suddenly, an omen of supernatural things to come. I just used my body, my physical self, to communicate an idea, he expands. Mahika tells the assembled journalist that he plans to make a film called The Demon Taker about an exorcism. However, to research and write script, he intends to retreat over the Christmas period to the country house of a friend, Alvaro, played by Walter Stewart. Vou passar dois meses na casa de campo de um amigo meu, estudando e analisando fatos que tenho catalogado. Já tem título? Já. O Tirador de Demônios. Exorcismo? Exorcismo. We follow Mahika's journey by boat to this house, his protracted voyage accompanied on the soundtrack by choral music. This sequence itself is quietly unsettling, home to, to the steady movement from a claustrophobic urban space to open rural locations, and perhaps unintentionally reminiscent of Marlowe's journey in Conrad's House of Darkness. Certainly, there's a sense of Mahika echoing the 1816 visit to the Via Diodati by Byron, John Polidori and the Shelleys that led to the birth of John Polidori's The Vampire and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. <laughs> At Alvaro's house, where Alvaro lives with his wife and children Bettina, Vilma and Luciana, Mojica experiences various supernatural phenomena whilst researching and attempting to write his new film script. These phenomena culminate in the apparent possession of Alvaro's father, Julio, and Alvaro's daughter, Vilma. Chairs move by themselves, a statue of Christ is decapitated suddenly. It's interesting, Mojica notes, seems like nature itself gets angry when I deny the existence of Coffin Joe. These supernatural events largely lens via the disorientating use of an extreme wide angle lens escalate, and it is revealed that Vilma is betrothed to Eugenio, the son of a local witch, who is also rumoured to be the son of the devil, in other words, Coffin Joe himself. To make matters more complicated, it's also revealed that Vilma is the daughter of the witch, and Alvaro and Lucha, who at the time were unable themselves to conceive a child, were given her under the proviso that when she came of age, she would marry Eugenio, her own biological brother. Along the way, Mahika gives voice to ideas about his films, which may or may not be the director's own, but the level of irony evident in this film is difficult to tell. He suggests that horror films are a form of catharsis, an extension of the fairy tales of childhood. I'm a simple creator of fantasy, Mahika says. Good and evil are characters in my work. At the climax of Bloody Exorcism, Mahika comes face to face with Coffin Joe, who has evolved from a devout materialist and atheist into the devil himself. Mahika's pale pink clown suit, a symbol of luxury, contrasts sharply with the costume of Coffin Joe and his trademark black suit, top hat and cape. Coffin Joe presides over a black mass, orchestrating the participants like the director of a motion picture. 
Spill the blood for those who do not deserve to live, he orders. This ceremony is to culminate in the marriage of Eugenio and Vilma and the sacrifice of Alvaro's youngest child, Bettina. During this ceremony, Mahika witnesses a litany of cruelties. People are dismembered, their body parts and organs cannibalised, tongues are torn out, ears are cut off. Finally, when the ritual builds towards the sacrifice of Bettina, Mahika takes action, confronting Coffin Joe with a crucifix. You're a creation of my own mind, he cries out, rescuing Bettina and the other members of Alvaro's family from Coffin Joe with a symbol of faith, reinforced by Mahika's stated declaration, I believe in God. This is certainly an interesting denouement for a filmmaker who claimed to have walked away from his Catholic faith in 1963 following an unpleasant encounter with a priest who apparently cursed Mahika when Mahika arrived late for Mass. By the late 1960s, the character of Coffin Joe had lodged himself so much in the collective unconscious of Brazilian popular culture to the extent that Mahika was becoming confused with his fictional creation. From Awakening of the Beast onwards, a number of Mahika's films, culminating in Bloody Exorcism, focused on the theme of separating the art from the artist. Mahika appears in some of these films as himself, often frustrated that other characters confuse him with Coffin Joe. A few years prior to Bloody Exorcism, Mahika made Awakening of the Beast, which features a scene in which Mahika, acting in the film as himself, in other words, as Mahika the filmmaker, is sneered at by the other members of a television discussion panel, a psychiatrist and a journalist. One of these directly criticises Mahika for, quoting, not having the intellectual capacity to understand the debate about drug culture that is taking place before making the mistake of referring to Mahika as Coffin Joe. Excuse me, but Coffin Joe stayed behind, Mahika asserts. You're talking to Jose Mahika Marins. Mahika reminds the others that he is not Coffin Joe, establishing a distance between himself and his fictional creation, a theme that will be explored with greater depth in Bloody Exorcism, in which Mahika actually confronts and exercises the character of Coffin Joe more directly. Given the confusion of Mahika and Coffin Joe, it's too easy to ascribe some of Coffin Joe's qualities, for example his nihilism and his misogyny, to Mahika himself. And this, in other words, the ease with which the artist can become confused with their art, is something that is at the core of Mahika's most memorable films, Bloody Exorcism and Awakening of the Beast in particular. Within Mahika's cinema generally, there's a sense of resistance through the challenging of taboos, which is comparable perhaps, to Spanish filmmaker Jess Franco's work during the Francoist dictatorship. There is an utter audacity in Mahika's approach to cinema. In the mid-70s, he filmed the surgery he had on his own eyes, directing the cameraman whilst the surgeon was working with his scalpel, and using this footage to enliven, enliven his otherwise unmemorable 1977 giallo all'italiana pastiche all his flesh. The footage is grotesque and sticks in the craw, despite the humdrum nature of the narrative into which it is placed. The story revolves around a revenge plot enacted by a scientist played by Mahika, who is scoured with acid thrown into his face by his unfaithful wife. Mahika's outrageousness in terms of his films was matched by his apparent naivete in terms of his business practices. I never got rich because I lived like a poet, he says in the 2001 documentary The Strange World of Jose Mahika Marins. I didn't care too much for money. I never thought about the future. The films themselves are variable in quality. However, they again bear comparison with Jess Franco's work in the sense that once one has seen a good number of them, a much bigger narrative evolves, one in which the filmmaker and the world he has created become intertwined and must be subjected to a bloody exorcism. (laughs) 